Peter, welcome to studio. Thank you. Peter, we've seen on the news all sorts of events happening throughout the world. Do we have the requisite leadership to take care of these events? Well, if you look at what has happened to the world uh, over the past 30, 40 years, we've seen a tremendous transformation uh, towards one integrated, complicated world with plenty of opportunities, uh, but also high risks and vulnerabilities. And my sense is leadership can make a difference, but it needs to be a holistic leadership. I don't think it's the right way to look for a small number of exceptional leaders where we can project all our hopes uh, into them, because what then will happen is we'll be disappointed. So what I argue in my book is we need as many leaders across sectors of society at all levels as we can get, and we should look out for qualities of leadership wherever we can find it. What made you write the book? Well, I've been uh, in various leadership positions for over 30 years. I probably had quite an unusual career in the sense of that I spent meaningful time in business uh, with McKinsey, with the bank, with UBS, with Partners Group, uh, uh, globally leading private market investment management company, but also in the civil society and social sector uh, with our own foundation, ELEA Foundation for Ethics and Globalization, which is an entrepreneurial philanthropy institute, IMD, which is a business school, a non-profit business school, uh, and other kind of non-profit uh, sectors. And I felt that uh, it's so important to basically have a cross-silo perspective. And often there are thick walls between these different sectors. And so I felt it might be useful to just share experiences I had across these leadership positions. Also, quite frankly, to inspire uh, current leaders, but even more new leaders, young people who aspire for leadership positions. You give a very detailed definition of what you mean by inclusive de uh, leadership. But what stood out for me is you advocate for a one world perspective in leadership. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, you know, when I grew up, uh, we looked at the world uh, in a very simple way. There was a first world, which was 15% of the population and 60% of the economic uh, activity. There was a second world that was closed behind the Iron Curtain. We didn't know anything about it. And there was a third world, which was everything else. And it was characterized by poverty, misery, war, uh, catastrophes, uh, natural disasters. And I think if you compare that view, and that's just 34, 30, 40 years ago, to today's world, where we really have one world, uh, where it's very connected. I mean, we have this interview here in uh, Johannesburg. Uh, I came from Nairobi, uh, where I met uh, uh, small shopkeepers uh, in a slum in Nairobi. Uh, I think today you just cannot afford to ignore the world if you are uh, kind of working in the Western world. Uh, and that's why I think it's so important uh, to basically get to know the world, and not just hotels and airports and conference rooms, uh, but to actually go into places where see how the life is. And obviously then you will see a lot of poverty. And then you will recognize that one of the biggest challenges that the planet faces is actually fighting poverty, which is one of the missions, or it's the mission of the foundation that my wife and I set up. If I look at the world at the moment, the zeitgeist of now is there's three things. There's a financial crisis that we engage with, there's political, global, political events that are happening, but there's also poverty. Do we need the same kind of leadership to address all three of those facets? or do they all need individual types of le leadership? Well, I think there are obviously very specific skill requirements in terms of leadership, uh, whether you run a business, whether you are a civil society leader, whether you are a political leader. Uh, but I do feel that there are uh, kind of common characteristics. And, and one characteristic is certainly this curiosity uh, for trying to understand other sectors' perspective. I think it's just very important for a business leader, rather than to find politicians slow and incompetent and inefficient, to kind of put himself into the shoes of a politician and see the world from his perspective. Uh, the same with a civil society leader, right? Rather than find business uh, to be greedy and to be short-sighted and narrow-minded, to put himself into the pressures of a business leader. And I think the more you can get these inclusive perspectives with leaders, I think the more it helps. And the second aspect is ethics. I think we today have, at least in some parts, uh, a secularized world, uh, but with very different value systems. I mean, we have Confucius, we have Western free market ideologies, we have uh, a lot of very different ethical systems. And I think the more important it is for leaders to articulate what they believe in, uh, to have them have a debate about what drives their value systems and how they uh, try to put their value systems and their virtues into work. And I think today, when you look at leadership dialogue, there is too much on technicalities and there is not enough on 
ethics, what is a good life, what is responsible behavior, what is fairness. I think I would want to uh, listen to leaders across sectors, business leaders, civil society leaders, political leaders, to be more pronounced about values and about ethics. What stands out in your book is you touch on new, the newness, new capitalism, new virtues versus old virtues. If you can just pick up, what is the difference between what you describe as old virtues and new virtues? Well, I think our generation has really seen a tremendous change and uh, transformation, obviously being driven by accelerated globalization, by new technologies. And I think with that, uh, also values have changed. And let me give you one example, uh, bank secrecy, right, which is a highly controversial topic in the, comp in the country I come from. Uh, 25, 30 years ago, the key virtue of a private client advisor was to protect his client's assets and his identity and his secrecy and his discretion. This has changed. And one needs to understand where it came from. This came from after World War II, uh, when particularly many European countries uh, were hurt by the world, world uh, war. Uh, obviously, Germans lost twice or three times their whole entire fortune within uh, just two generations. And so the private client's advisor's value was to protect these clients' interests. And today, obviously, uh, there are different interests. The world has changed, and uh, tax systems have become different, uh, and uh, values on uh, and attitudes towards taxation have become different. And so today, uh, you need different virtues to excel as a private client advisor. And I think there are many, many areas where virtues have changed, uh, and I think one needs to just be clear about it uh, and, 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 and reflect on what that means. If I can paraphrase from your book, you say that we don't need to wait for a new capitalism we need leadership that adapts that. If you can just expand on that first. Yes, I mean, there was after the financial crisis, there was a lot of talk about new capitalism, and it's a somewhat fuzzy concept. Uh, but on the other hand, and I'm not sure whether we need a completely new uh, conceptual uh, ground for, for, to define capitalism, but what I see in my practical activities being changing are expectations of the different stakeholders vis-a-vis -vis what companies, what business should accomplish. I mean, you see uh, clients uh, being very demanding for ethical products, uh, for fair traded products, uh, for products that do not include child labor. Uh, you see see talented people, they want to work for companies who have a clear set of values, who have a clear statement of how they benefit society beyond just creating shareholder value. You have investors who put a lot of emphasis on ESG criteria, ecological, social governance criteria. And so I think to basically reflect these expectations and to proactively address them and maybe also shape them in a way, uh, I think is more and more the role of a business leader. And I think that is in a way different to what it was 15, 20, 30 years ago. Peter, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. Thank you for your time and wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you.